This week on the Green Left News Podcast, 12 months of genocide and resistance. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal Land in Sydney. I'm Riley Breen. I'm talking to you from the land of the Waikato Hongo, in Perth, Blue Perth. And uh, we've got uh, today. We're going to be uh, focusing on the 12 months of genocide that we've all just been uh, witnessed, and you know the con- constant protests and solidarity movement that's been happening uh, here in this continent, and also you know all of the resistance that's taking place, you know, in Gaza in Lebanon and all around the world. So as we're recording this, uh, the October 7 um, date has just passed and there was been massive protests uh, on the weekend of October 5th and 6th. Um, And we're going to be talking about all of that. But before we get started, I just wanted to mention that we are recording on stolen land that was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And... Green Left pledges to uh, stand with First Nations peoples in campaigns for justice, uh, land rights and self-determination and sovereignty. Um, And just uh, before we start, I'd like to mention if you would like to help Green Left uh, help us with the work that we're doing and keep it going, um, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It also makes a massive difference if you uh, share this show uh, or, you know, put a like or a comment and share it with your friends it makes a huge difference to uh, get more people to to see the content that we're producing here um so yeah so as i mentioned we've just had this big weekend of rallies uh there's actually still more to come um for october uh which is being kind of designated as a month of action by the australian palestine advocacy group uh network but there's also you know protests that are happening all around the country and have been every week, uh, which I think is a pretty significant milestone. I know here in Gadigal, Sydney, we've had a a protest every single weekend um, for 52 weeks, which is, you know, something that I don't think any of us have ever seen before. I don't think it's ever happened in uh, this country, such sustained mass protests. I mean, um, just a a quick story. Back back in October, the very first Palestine rally post-October 7th that I attended, I um maybe I shouldn't shouldn't share this, but I will. Um, I, I chatted to one of the organisers, and you know, in the past, you know, I think I think most of us who've been in the movement for a while have seen this. You know, every couple of years, Israel would do some new war crime. There'd be a couple of protests, maybe two or three at most, and then it would, the movement would kind of fizzle down. The anger would subside. People would forget. And you know, back back. In, uh, when this first started, after October 7th, you know, I went to that rally and I, I spoke to one of the organisers and he said, yeah, we're going to have a protest every single week until till this ends. And I kind of cynically said, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, some miracle of organising ability that's necessarily, I mean, they're good organisers. I, I don't mean to discredit them. Um, but it's, it's not because... You know, if anything's being done differently on the organization end of things, it's because Israel just has not fucking stopped. You know, they have just every time, every time, you know, and the movement has died down quite a few times. People have gotten exhausted, they've gotten demoralized. A lot of the rallies had started to lower in terms of attendance and energy, and uh, even the content of speech was kind of very repetitive, and nobody really had anything new to say because it's like, how much? How many more times can you just say this is fucked, right? Mm, uh, yeah. But you know, every, every time, every time the movement threatened to fizzle out, Israel just did some new horrible thing that we had to talk about that mobilised people again and again. Which is, um, yeah, it's you know, I, awesome. I haven't seen the market, um, and we've not had you know just because of the size of our city, we've not had um, weekly protests in Perth, but just. Again, the, the sustained output of protests is something I don't think anyone has seen. Um, yeah, it's this kind of uh, weird feeling of, you know, the absolute, you know, horror of, of what's happened over the past year. I don't think anyone's, could, you couldn't possibly be prepared for that or, you know, it, uh, 
you know, a year ago we wouldn't be looking looking to now and thinking, oh yeah, this will still be going on, you know. Um, but there's also the kind of other side of like, wow, the, the ongoing resistance is so inspiring. So you kind of get this two, two-sided thing of feeling, you know, absolutely drained and devastated by everything that's happened. But also, you know, there's this kind of like, uh, you know, uplifting side of like, people are taking to the streets, you know, every weekend or every fortnight and, you know, making their voices loud and clear against um, this genocide. Um, and I think part of where, you know, as you said, sometimes the, the protest numbers have gone down a bit, then they're picked up again. One thing that was quite significant about the rallies on the previous weekend, um, in particularly in Sydney and uh, Nam, Melbourne, is I feel like the numbers were almost back to the peak of like November 2023 uh, when it was huge, like uh, 50 to 100,000 or so people. I think the rallies this weekend were around 50,000 50, potentially. I don't have uh, exact okay. numbers. Yeah. It wasn't, um, um, it wasn't that big here, but um, it certainly was, I did notice quite a, a large, a lot of new faces, well, faces I hadn't seen in a while, for one thing, faces that um, I've never seen before, and just, you know, a, an overall increase in numbers from the last couple of weeks. And I think that's both down to the invasion of Lebanon, which is just another escalation. Like I said, you know, people turn up, start to turn up again, and there's, when Israel does something, some fresh new horror. Um, but also, yeah, the anniversary, I think, is really mobilized because they've just gone like, fuck, this has been going on for 12 months now, I've got to do something yeah, hundred percent, and I think also we, you know, had the National Day of Action organised by APAN the previous weekend, the September twenty ninth, um, yeah. and that kind of kick started this, you know, kind of renewed month of um of action. Um, but I think uh, what's happened is kind of like people were coming to those early rallies um, when it first kicked off, and they were huge, and everyone was so shocked and and angry about what was happening. We were. So, you know so determined to stop it um and you know that con has continued throughout but a lot of people who uh got involved in activism or became wanted to do something in their own area or in their own workplace or you know what in whatever kind of sphere of their own lives they could make a difference they went and, and started doing that so not only were people continuing to attend the the main protests but we've seen so many other actions kick off there's been you know like unions uh, uh, various things happening through union movements. Uh, there's been like the blockades of the Zim ships. Yeah. Uh, there's been weapons factory uh, picket lines and blockades. Um, there's been the all these like community uh, based protest groups have formed up. Like uh, this, this seems to be every suburb in Melbourne has its own, you know, suburb for Palestine group. And there's also regional groups that have been, you know, obviously. Uh, everywhere has its own context so they're doing different activities and different things but it's been you know uh, a diversification of of the movement and then what it's felt like is that all those groups have you know reached into new parts of the uh of the society and that then brought more people back for the big rally uh previous week i think there's still a long way to go in terms of the movement i mean labor is still fully supporting israel uh, which is obviously pretty fucking awful and they should be fully, you know, ashamed of how they've been in those past, uh, 12 months. Um, but I do think, you know, people, some people think, take that as like, uh, oh, the, the, the movement hasn't won anything, hasn't achieved any of its goals. But I do think, uh, you know, without the pressure of the, the movement, things would be a lot worse. All well, the Australian government's reaction would be a lot worse. And without the international kind of uh movement which is you know millions of people around the world um israel could have gone even harder than they have which you know it's hard to imagine when you're seeing you know what's happening but without uh this yeah big international movement things could have been even worse they could have uh killed you know double the amount we're, we're currently yeah. around forty-eight thousand on the kind of official statistic but as we've reported many times um there's you know those numbers could be like very understated um and the lancet predicted you know 118,000 that was like months ago so it's hard to say how many people have actually been killed in this genocide so far but it's like safe to say that that uh, 48,000 number is is an, an undercount for sure 
Yeah, I think you, you touched on something there. It's easy to forget that we are part of an international movement. You know, I mean, it's especially here in Australia where I think, you know, next to maybe Germany and, and the US would probably be uh, the two more, you know, significant co- contributors to, to Israeli, you know, um, you know, the two more, more significant allies than Australia. But I think next to them, we're probably the third, you know, uh, and... You know, the successes we've seen in Spain, in Norway, in, you know, a bunch of other countries around the world, you know, probably wouldn't have been possible without the fact that there is this international movement that exists everywhere, no matter how small or how hard you have to push. And I think um, certainly here at home, you know, the Albanese government is feeling the pain. They are feeling the pain. It's not, you know, they aren't. Uh, I mean, I, I I want Albo to, to have an aneurysm, but <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but I think it's, it's pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to mention another though, country was France, who recently said they'll stop selling uh, weapons to Israel, um, I think be- uh, because of the Lebanon attacks. Um, yeah, there's, there's, I think, you know, the way that we're going to win more concessions from the Labour government, get them to actually cut ties, uh, do something, you know, more than just saying, oh, we're, we're sad about lives lost, uh, civilian lives, blah, 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 or both sides in um, the genocide by saying, you know, we, you know, we, we stand with Israel and the Palestinians who have lost yeah, their lives. Yeah, exactly what this statement, just as an aside, the statement um, the Albanese government put out on the anniversary was exactly that. It was it almost elevated the the value of Israeli lives over the lives of Palestinians by saying, you know, making this just false equivalence between <laughs> outright genocide and one attack. Like as though, mm. you know, the lives lost are exactly, you know, as valuable as each other. But if if a hundred times more lives have been lost on the other side, then how can that be true unless Israeli lives are just worth more. That's kind of the implication, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, that that statement was terrible in and of itself. And then uh, the, the uh, Liberals, Peter Dutton, wanted to make an even worse statement <laughs> saying, <laughs> well, you know, but, you know, we, we stand with Israeli values, like we share values, which, you know, both countries built on genociding the original inhabitants and setting up a a, a colony and uh, settling land. So we do share a lot of values with Israel, uh, <laughs> but not in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on some level, I mean, he, you know, the Dutton and the Liberals are, are objectively worse, but it's somehow less frustrating because at least they're fucking <laughs> you know, they just they're nakedly evil. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. The LP just kind of, they frustrate me more just because of how, how much they... You know, they hide behind false equivalences and you know half statements, and you know they could, they pretend that they can be both a friend to the oppressor and the oppressed, which mm. is possible. Yeah, well, they try to act like you know these kind of sensible, you know, middle of the road. You know, we're not extreme like the Greens or you know the socialists or whatever, or the people who are protesting. Um, you know, yeah. the Trotskyists on campus, as he <laughs> as he said. A little while ago. Oh yeah, I, I forgot about that. Oh my god. I'm proud. I'm pr- which I'm proud to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they try and p- position themselves like you know, claim you know we're we're serious government. We don't you know we're uh, obviously s- shocked and you know saddened by these deaths, but we're we're not going to take any extreme measures like actually stopping selling weapons to. <laughs> Israel. Well, they claim they don't sell any weapons to Israel because we only sell parts of weapons, yeah. which couldn't possibly be used to make weapons. Um, but yeah, so if, if I sell you um, the component parts of a gun, I haven't sold you a gun. I've just sold yeah. you a part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to find uh, someone you else down the supply chain. Yeah, <laughs> and also here's the instruction manual to assemble it yourself, and some money to do it as well. And if I didn't give you these parts, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously there's a whole bunch of things that, uh, labor government could be doing and should be doing, uh, and you know, won't do unless there's even more pressure than we feel now. We have to make this, you know, not just, you know, the hundred thousand or so, uh, who protested last weekend, but you know, have to get, you know, 
everyone in society or a majority of society to be involved. And I think it's hard when we've been out on the streets every week, we've been talking about this um, with each other and amongst ourselves and organizing to, to, to imagine that there are people out there who aren't really following this and obviously they should be and it's it's kind of you, you can't even imagine why, why you would not be uh caring about this uh, as like the the big issue of our, of our time but there are people out there who who aren't and there's a temptation to you know tell them to go fuck themselves like <laughs> i can't believe you're not doing anything to resist this genocide but we actually need to bring those people in as well and so yeah, find ways to connect uh, and and convince them of of our position and we, we can't blame them i mean i think I, I can't remember who i'm quoting here i think it might be marx actually but you know the the idea that the, the dominant ideology in any society is the, the ideology of the ruling class like it comes back to, to that right just you can't blame people for you know you switch on abc or fbs or any other news channel you read the west australian or the australian or the age or whatever you know, any consumption of news you have makes the same false privileges, make, tells, you know, different different angles. Less, you know, some will, you know, if you read The Guardian, you might get a bit more liberal perspective. If you read, uh, you know, um, some Murdoch crash, you might get something else. But the more or less you get the liberal narratives. Uh, so mm. You can't blame people for just accepting that. Like, what else are they going to do if they're not exposed to ideas? It's our job as, as in Green Left and we'll plug um, people to support us to, and you know other you know Green Left's not alone. There's other great um, progressive as well. But, um, to actually reach those people and and, mm. them, and I think the majority of people when you talk to them, they you know they might not get it immediately, but it's not you know they're not evil people. They're not bad people. They just haven't really been exposed to the same things. Yeah, and there's like the element of, you know, with the cost of living crisis, housing crisis, people are like struggling to get by. So that makes things, uh, makes people less likely to get involved in, in, you know, political actions or, you know, protesting or uh, organizing. Um, so there's all these barriers that we'll have to work out as a movement how to push through over the next, you know, few months or year or however long this continues for. Um, but, it is good to see, you know, how many people have, you know, become taken action about this um, is inspiring. Um, and I think, as I was saying before, all the, the diversity of actions, you know, the, the, the community rallies, the et cetera, et cetera, workplace stuff, that helps to bring new people in. So that's all really important. But yeah, as you said, uh, it's hard to go against the whole state media apparatus and the uh, capitalist media. Um, and it is good. It is a good reason to plug Green Left. Um, so, as I said at the start, go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Um, but also, we really yeah. need the money. <laughs> the, I think the other side of this that is the reason that's cutting through some of that is the social media, um, which has been you know people talk about this is like the live stream genocide that um, you can go on your social media feed and see some of the most like horrible things you've ever seen. Uh, of, of things that are happening in Gaza. Um, and it's like right there, there's no filter. There's no like, you know, news read us telling you that this is not, uh, something you yeah. should be concerned about. You can see it directly and you can, you know, talk, you can message people who are, uh, in Gaza and hear about their experiences firsthand. Like there's, there's all these different ways of, of connecting, um, that haven't been that, that are kind of fairly new. So, uh, that's been interesting. And it's also, it's also given, you know, people within, you know, Australia or whatever, uh, within a city to be able to connect more easily with it, with other like-minded people and form these groups. Um, I know like, uh, for example, our green left social media coverage of, you know, Palestine rallies gets say on Twitter or something gets shared, uh, way more widely than, um, some, some other articles and things, because there's so many people who are looking out for that kind of coverage and wanting to know what's happening wanting to, wanting to know more so i think that's uh, another important side of it yeah um speaking of the the actions that are happening maybe we should uh talk a little bit about some of the actions that have happened uh you know for the the anniversary and as part of this month of action you know there's been a there's been quite a an impressive flurry of activities so 
maybe we could just um, talk about some of them. I think one of them, um, you know, I saw an article in Green Left recently, which was about um, a bunch of people marching to Canberra to um, to basically just protest outside of Parliament, um, and it had quite an impressive, you know, uh, resume of attendees, including Lydia Thorpe, Adam Payman, Green Senator Marine. I'm going to put to this. I'm sorry, Marine Faruqi. Marine Faruqi, thank you. And uh, it was attended pretty well, like 300 people from across the country, which, mm. you no, know, that's a small rally, but in the context of A, Canberra, which is smaller than Perth, um, and B, the fact that most of them are local, like they've made the effort to, to travel, and that's actually quite significant. Um, yeah. And so that, there, was, um, there was kind of two parts to that act action. So there was a, a kind of media conference within Parliament where a lot of those, you know, big name... Um, people like big name like politicians uh, Lydia Thorpe and Fatima Payman Maureen Faruqi and some uh, other activists as well were were speaking to the press um, and we've covered a lot of the, those quotes you can find online or uh, on the Green Left website and then yeah there was also the kind of rally outside where yeah there's hundreds gathered in mostly from interstate um, traveled yeah from Sydney or from Melbourne or from wherever to to join um, and it's kind of, you know, taking the momentum from the weekend rallies, uh, to parliament. Um, so that took place on the 8th of October, which was the Tuesday. Um, I know there was like a busload of, uh, uh, activists from Sydney went down together. So, um, that was quite a good action. I just also wanted to talk about the, uh, I guess the, the, the attempts to repress the protests, uh, particularly here in Gadigal, Sydney. Um, so basically the weekend the rally before this um had took place just after uh the lebanon Le attacks on lebanon really escalated so you know obviously people took you know lebanon uh, fla uh flags and a few people took you know hezbollah uh flags or you know uh signs with uh supporting hezbollah on there um i talked a little bit about this on the podcast last week about you know the the attempt to ban signs or, or like uh, placards supporting what are these kind of registered terrorist organizations and how that though that uh, label is you know doesn't really mean anything when it's determined by the government and it's not really determined doesn't really reflect the reality or what most people would uh, uh, say so you know it's you know technically illegal to well, the, the, the illegality is kind of uh, blurry with, you know, showing a terrorist uh, symbol because it, it's um, technically you can only be charged for it if it's like shows your intent to to do a terror act as well. Um, so just displaying the sign is not enough, which is what uh, was some of the confusion last week. But basically in response to that, uh, the New South Wales police said, we're going to try and ban the protest on October 6th and also the vigil on October 7. Um, so this went to the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a huge media flurry about, you know, um, you know, that they were basically trying to say, you know, pro terrorist groups trying to organize rallies. Um, that, As though we were celebrating the, the attack rather than mourning. The yeah. Death. Yeah. Trying to say ce celebrating uh, the deaths of, Israeli uh, of, of Jew, Jewish people um, and also kind of saying you know there's there could be violence they're they're planning to march past a synagogue and stuff like this but it's all you know all bullshit basically I mean there's been 50 there'd been 51 weeks of rallies prior to that every weekend where nothing yeah. no serious incidents have gone down um, there's been no evidence of anti-semitism or anything like that. Um, in fact, the route marching past the synagogue was the route that the police had given to the, uh, rally organizers. Um, so the, yeah, so the, the case went to the court and, uh, it was actually a, a big, big victory for the Palestine movement. Um, mm -hmm. Palestine action group uh, rally organizers defeated the New South Wales police in court and the rally was allowed to go ahead. And what I've heard, I mean, I wasn't there obviously, but, um, you know, ironically, the the level of media coverage that it received probably actually boosted the numbers. 
you know, for sure, for sure. About it, they wouldn't have heard of otherwise. And I thought, fuck, I'll go to that. Yeah, um, I spoke to quite a few people who had traveled from like a nearby, like Newcastle or Wollongong, like traveled, you know, an hour or so to get there because they had heard of it, like the, the chance for the police were trying to shut it down and wanted to, you know, support the protest and be yeah. an extra number, an extra body there if, if anything went down. Um, but you know, the, the, in the end, the police were actually, uh, didn't, didn't, uh, crack out the big guns or, or do what they kind of thing they did, you know, disrupt land forces a few months ago. Um, they didn't, uh, go, uh, off the rails, but, um, I think there was only one arrest. Uh, there was definitely a lot of, um, what people did to get around the ban. I'll set the scene a little bit because we, we get to the rally and, uh, the police have set up these huge like billboards, uh, like electronic billboards next to like the speaker platform that have this big sign that says like, you, you're not allowed to display Hezbollah flags, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they've gone to this massive effort to, to put those signs up and there was a huge police presence. Uh, but what people did to get around that ban was uh, what, just bring, you know, yellow flags or yellow and green flags. <laughs> uh, one well, person was... Was, um, for the Wallabies, the football yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. One person said, yeah, uh, one flag was yellow and had in green, like supporting the boys. And they're like, yeah, it's for the <laughs> Socceroos or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So people got around that in clever ways. Uh, and the only person who did get arrested was holding a sign that was basically equating israel with the nazi regime in germany had a, a swastika on it which is another kind of banned symbol but um obviously they're just pointing out that there are similarities between a genocidal israeli regime and the genocidal nazi regime which you know it's hard to refute yeah. that and um, i think um the fact that you know the police went to so much effort to try and crack down on this and and also you know i don't i haven't really followed the news quite so closely because to be honest watching abc makes me feel sick sometimes <laughs> that just can't make me too angry um but um I, so i don't know if the state premier came out and said anything but i i did see you know anthony albanese coming out and saying oh it's so insensitive and blah blah blah, blah. the fact that um you know both of those things and probably others that i haven't seen you know it does show that you know the government both the state government and the federal government are actually under a lot of pressure because of our protests like it's not you know it is having an effect it's not mm. it's easy to see but the the reaction you can see it in the reactions yeah for sure and there was yeah more than 140 organizations um you know signed on to support the protest and uh support the you know the 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 case to let it happen um, so there is a lot of, you know, civil society support for the right to protest, which is another kind of fight that's been happening, uh, bubbling along in the past few years is constant kind of attempts to, uh, repeal the right to protest in various different ways. One of the, yeah. So, uh, Chris Minns, who's the Labor New South Wales state premier did, you know, come out against the rally and as did Albo and, um, but now what they're trying to do, cause they've obviously been a bit embarrassed and failed with this uh attempt to ban this rally now they're kind of floating this idea of hang on that we're spending so much money on the police uh to uh, police these rallies every weekend um i i, I guess the the police probably get you know good sunday rates and public holiday rates as well over time um so they're saying they're trying to float this idea of uh the the protest organizers should have to pay for the police um, oh, fucked. Do we pay for our right to, for democracy? Yeah, <laughs> literally. So that's a pretty shocking um, response from like the Labor government. And it, uh, it's been actually a bit of an outcry with some Labor MPs. Yeah. I mean, none of us asked out. for the police to be there. We're, I think the organisers are quite happy if the police just go home. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. We don't. We would rather they not be there, and there would be less. There would be less trouble if they weren't there because they're the ones stirring shit up. Um, but yeah, so, I, uh, we'll have to keep an eye on this and see if they keep trying to push, uh, this ahead. Um, but yeah, as I said, there's, you know, out uh, some labor MPs who have come out against this already, uh, unionists, um, who have come out against this, who are obviously connected to kind of labor's p 
political support base. Um, so, you know, that's a, a, something to keep an eye on. An eye on. Um, so, yeah, that was a, a, a win to defeat that. Uh, I also saw there was a bunch of uh, protests in some cities across the country. It was kind of a national day of action against uh, Caltex. Um, I wondered if you wanted to explain, I guess, the, c the connection between Caltex and, you know, why, why are pro-Palestine protesters protesting Caltex? Yeah, so, uh, you know, correct me if I have some of these details wrong, but um, I believe uh, APAN has listed um, Chevron, the oil company, as one of its primary BDS targets. Uh, Chevron owns both Caltex and Puma service stations, so um, they're both subsidiaries. Uh, and Chevron has been drilling oil off of I mean, you know, it has a long history of drilling in a lot of conflict zones, actually. But um, in particular, for this uh, uh, for this action and for this boycott uh, movement, um, it has uh, a strong interest in the Mediterranean Sea, just off the coast of both Gaza and Israel. And obviously, the war in Gaza. I mean, there's a kind of an economic or uh, imperial interest there in actually securing those waters. You know. Uh, and making it easier, essentially, for um, Chevron to drill there. Um, so that's uh, why Chevron's been identified as a BDS target. Um, and so I think in every every city, including Perth here, I know, but um, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, um, I think it was one in Brisbane and Adelaide. I'm not sure about Adelaide, actually. But yeah, Adelaide def yeah, def definitely had one in Adelaide. I saw some photos. Okay. Oh, great. Um, so, yeah, there was... Um, so, ba basically, people assembled outside. You know, they picked a, a kind of central service station or in by Caltex and Puma um, and stood outside with signs. It wasn't a picket, as far as I understand. You know, they didn't block access because obviously that... You, know, you, need num you need a lot of numbers to do um, you know. And I think in the context of this, you'd probably just piss people off without them really understanding why you're doing it. Um, but uh, from what I've seen, you know, there was an, uh, a lot of banners saying, you know, Caltex uh, and Chevron funds genocide, stuff like that. Because I think um, I think Chevron actually has quite a few economic ties to the Israeli government as well. It's not just, you know, it doesn't just happen to be there. It's mm. quite like, um, because obviously they want to secure their monopoly on that region um yeah. so um these actions kind of uh stood outside the, the service stations and tried to i guess just educate people who are you know just happen to need to fill up uh the cars or whatever and say hey you know why don't you just go to this other you know this is why we're doing this we believe that you know we should boycott these stations there's plenty of other stations around usually why don't you go to one of those instead and you know leave this one and uh, i don't know how successful they were in turning people around i know there's been a um there was a similar action here in perth that i participated in a couple of months ago it was very small like there was only six of us really mm. um and it was early in the morning on a saturday so there wasn't much traffic to begin with but we did get uh at least one positive engagement with the person that time um, so I imagine, you know, from what I've seen from the photos, the, these actions were quite a bit larger as well. Yeah. Uh, I imagine there's there's probably quite a bit of positive engagement from that. And at the very least, people, you know, most people, like like we said earlier in the episode, people just don't think about it. They just, you know, it's not that they're they're bad people. It's just they're not they're a not aware and they're b just like, you know, they don't really understand why it should affect their lives. Yeah. Well, it's it's, um, it's like as you said, it's uh. It's part of the boycott, divestment, sanctions kind of movement, um, which has a, a range of targets. And I think some people struggle to kind of keep track of what they should be boycotting or what what's. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a few lists out there that are just way too big. You know, you're mm. supposed to boycott Coke, Pepsi, Smiths. You know, like every single company. And at that point, you know, you go to a grocery store. What the hell are you going to buy? It's like yeah. every, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, the the official APAN BDS list is quite carefully curated to be just a, a small number of companies. So it's actually 
you know, a, a, an average consumer can actually manageably accomplish it. Yeah, and I think the the idea of these boycotts is not necessarily to you know put these companies out of business. Um, obviously, they they these are huge multinational companies that have. Uh, you know, make huge profits every year and a, a, a group of activists protesting out of petrol station every few months is not going to shut down Caltex, but it may put enough pressure on them to uh, start to consider divesting from uh, Israel. Um, yeah, at a certain point, it's just, you know, they do a, they have actuaries and analysts and whatever, they do a cost benefit analysis and they mm. say, okay, costs here are too high. It's just not worth the effort. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that that was good to see um, those rallies, and we put a few photos up online of that in our kind of weekly roundup. Uh, just another quick uh, action I wanted to mention that took place in Maganjin or Brisbane. Um, I think the the first one was on October five, but the coming up uh, there's a few more coming up around the country. Um, was the big ride for Palestine? So basically a bunch of uh, activists getting together with their bikes and going on a bike ride in waving Palestinian flags, wearing, uh, you know, green, black and red um, colors um, and, you know, draw uh, obviously to raise a profile of the movement, but also um, they're raising money for uh, uh, aid projects in Palestine via Union Aid Abroad. So the... That was in in Brisbane, and the the big rally, the the twelve month anniversary rally, is actually taking place this weekend in Brisbane. So, if you're in Brisbane or anywhere nearby, um, that's on October thirteenth, um, and they're doing a lot of promotion for that. If you go to Justice for Palestine, Maganjin online, so they um, they'll, they have all the information there or on the Green Left website as well. Um, but yeah, in in absence of their uh, uh, having a, a rally that this weekend they had the the bike ride and there's more planned i think october 13th 19th and 20th so uh you can find a bit more information online if you just search uh big ride for palestine um there's there, there has been a, a, a group of a contingent of coming to the sydney rally where they all show up on their bikes which has been quite cool um yeah, that sounds fun I've, I've off the top of my head i can't remember the name of the group um but yes uh def you could probably look that up as well um it's different ways to get involved. Um, and then uh, another th side of things is uh, we have we did a few episodes a few months ago talking a lot about the student um, Palestine movement, particularly when the encampments were um, ongoing. And then kind of out of the encampments came these uh, student general meetings. So there was, I think the first one was at the University of Sydney, but there were they've, they've now happened at quite a few different universities, including... Actually, I've got a list here. So, uh, University of Queensland had one, Deakin University, Australian National University, Queensland University of Technology, Monash Uni. There, there might be more than that. I think maybe you might know about the, some of the ones in WA. Um, but the r recent one was at the University of New South Wales, which passed three pro-Palestine pro motions at their student general meeting on September 26. Um, so, they have uh the motion was uh, basically to disclose and divest there's about three million in financial investments in weapons companies they want to divest from and also cut you know research partnerships with those weapons companies um so there's about 500 students or so attended the meeting and that prompted them having to move from like a lecture theater to an out outdoor lawn um and uh the motion passed with a massive majority of 501 to 17. So it's good to see that kind of uh, continuing the, 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 for students to continue uh, putting pressure on their universities to, to dis, uh, disclose and divest from weapons companies and Israeli institutions. But just on that note of uh, student kind of protest for Palestine, there was uh, two incidents this week, actually like yesterday as we're recording, where um, police have been called on student protesters. So the first one was in uh, the University of Melbourne where they were holding a sit-in at the Chancellor's office um, and police were called and, you know, threatened to uh, arrest protesters, kick them out. Um, and so after some kind of negotiation and um, chanting, the, the, the protesters decided to, you know, do a tactical retreat and... Uh, leave the office um, to avoid, you know, getting in uh, uh, 
serious trouble kind of thing. Um, ob- and obviously not backing down on the campaign, but uh, just trying to, you know, avoid uh, fines and uh, jail time and things like that. And then on the same day, Western Sydney University, the Parramatta campus, um, there was two protesters were arrested um, by police. And there's video up online to give you go to WSU for Palestine Instagram. It's pretty shocking, actually, like to see. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can embed it uh, on the video here, um, if you're watching the video version. But uh, yeah, the police, you know, grabbed a couple of activists and uh, tackled them to the ground and arrested them uh, they as far as i'm aware they're now out on uh, on bail um, but it's a pretty you know shocking escalation of of repression of student protests from the police uh, obviously from new south wales police at wsu and uh victoria police um yeah so yeah that's just another another aspect of things that are happening around this time um and the students have been a, a massive inspiration for a lot of uh, people uh, in the past 12 months um, the encampments, I think, came at a time when, you know, the movement was probably struggling a little bit to keep up its pace. And then suddenly there was this huge influx of uh, energy and inspiration from the actions that students were taking. Um, you know, in, uh, obviously uh, started the encampment movement, started in the US and then quickly spread uh, to Australia and around um, the world. And it's, I don't have all the information here and we've I've talked about this a lot before, so I won't go into it too much, but there's a lot of universities that had encampments set up and some of them lasted for, you know, two or three months and have actually won significant ground, uh, gains from the university, including disclosure, but there's obviously still a long way to go on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's another aspect of things that are happening. Um, I would encourage everyone to obviously continue to attend any uh protests they're still continuing weekly here in sydney and in melbourne uh as i said the brisbane and uh, 12 month anniversary rally is this weekend i also yeah, just want the anniversary to... rally in perth is this weekend as well oh yes great yes because you guys had a snap action this week like on... yeah that's right we had it kind of de facto served as a anniversary rally as well but um it was a snap action for lebanon last saturday last mm. yeah last saturday and this saturday the is it the 12th at 3 30 p.m they'll at uh yeah there'll be one here yeah awesome so yeah perth people get to that and um you can find these inf- the information on these events on the green left calendar greenleft.org.au slash events and also make sure to if there's anything that's not on there that you can see you can actually uh, submit your own events just putting a facebook link or a you know event bright link or whatever um and that we can update that uh to make sure we don't miss anything um also just wanted to give a bit of a shout out to, you know, the journalists, the photographers who have been covering the rallies, um, over the past year, as we know, like the, so many journalists have been killed in Gaza. There's already a lot of journalists who have, have been killed in Lebanon in, in this, uh, last few weeks, um, who are being targeted, you know, for telling the truth, putting the, the reality of what's happening out there. Um, and obviously we're not facing that kind of danger or threat to our lives uh, in Australia. But there is, you know, a lot of uh, pressure from, you know, the big kind of media companies to to not talk about Gaza. So, you know, people know about, say, like Antoinette Latouf, who was kind of sacked from the ABC for being supporting Palestine. Um, and there's a lot of... Even, like, it wasn't even support. It was just like a very, very mild uh, yeah. Twitter post, I think. Yeah, it literally. was just reporting a, a basic fact that the UN had reported on. Yeah, hundred percent. It was nothing even controversial. So you can see the kind of pressure that people are on. And there's been, you know, uh, activists, photographers, journalists who have been at every rally. Um, my Twitter feed is kind of uh, my Instagram feed is kind of filled with uh, these photographers, and a lot of them have, have very kindly allowed Green Left to republish their work. And obviously, as a kind of uh, uh, people powered grassroots publication we uh, can't really afford to pay photographers for their work so it's uh, all been a you know a gesture of kindness and solidarity from these photographers to allow their images to be shared and I think it's such an important role um, all of the media like independent uh, grassroots media people who are making sure that you know it's not just the rallies in person as they happen but getting those online getting those shared around um, I think 
a lot of people have been upskilled in the past 12 months of how to like live stream, how to, you know, quickly get photos and stuff up. And um, yeah. so I do, yeah, just wanted to give a bit of a shout out to all of those people in different cities. And there's probably hundreds that uh, we're not even aware of. So um, yeah. shout out to you as well. Definitely been uh, quite beautiful to see, you know, people, you know, they come to the rally and I think, you know, I'm at the rally, but that's not enough. I want to do more. What can I do? And I think, oh, you know, they kind of try, think through what skills they already have or what they're already interested in. And they just kind of go out and do do something like, you know, become, train themselves to become a photographer or, you know, take videos and stuff. But, you know, even if they've never done it before, it's actually been quite nice to see people just want to contribute something and then proactively do that. Yeah, 100%. There's, there's different ways for everyone to get involved, um, which I think is an important way to think about it. Um, so we're kind of coming up on the end here. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up, um, Riley? No, I think we've uh, just about covered everything. We've uh, talked a bit more than we planned to, really. Yeah, yeah. There's just a, there's a lot to say, um, kind of condensing the last year into a, a podcast. Um, wh uh, what we're going to do is we're going to play some Vox Pops uh, interviews with some people at the protests uh, over the past weekend. So we'll put that on at the end of the podcast here, um, just to give a bit of a kind of flavor and a bit of a sense of, you know, how people are uh, thinking, feeling about this 52 week, 12 month, one year, however you want to put it, um, marker. Uh, it's funny because, you know, it's just a, it's just a kind of arbitrary marker of, of time passing. Um, but I think it's, it's been, feels quite significant um, that this is yeah, still I mean, going on. You know, we record New Year's and birthdays and, you know, every other rotation of the sun. It's, you know, there's something about it that I think does make it significant to us. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, we'll put, we'll play that uh, clip at the end uh, after we wrap up. Um, so uh, I guess before we finish, I just wanted to give a uh, special thanks to uh, Sean Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for all the music. Um, you hear at the start of the podcast every week um as we've said you can uh become a supporter of green left at greenleft.org.au forward slash support uh, and it's actually a really good deal it's you know five dollars a month gets you the online subscription uh, you get the uh, sent to your email um digital edition every week and the, the kind of the pdf of the hard copy every two weeks and then for only ten dollars a month you get the actual physical green left paper that you will have seen at rallies and things like that um delivered to your door which is a pretty good deal um and the, we've also got a deal of uh first the first month is free so if you sign up you get the first month free um and you know that helps uh you know it, it's not just you know buying the paper so you get this information or whatever it's just it's more about supporting uh grassroots media and activist media um and you know we really, really really appreciate all of our supporters and people who make donations and things like that uh so that we can continue doing this um you know getting this kind of all this equipment and stuff that we use for the podcast and you know producing the paper every week and uh things like that so yeah greenleft.org.au forward slash support and as we mentioned as well the greenleft calendar greenleft.org.au forward slash events and obviously, there's the main website. You can read all the articles and coverage of uh, news in Australia and around the world. Um, and please pass this podcast on to your friends who might be interested. Uh, leave a review or a comment or a like. Um, help us bump, get bumped up the algorithm because, as we know, the algorithms don't support uh, you know lefty media or pro-Palestine stuff. A uh, number of TikToks that have been taken down because they're you know against community guidelines because they're uh, to pro-Palestine um, is pretty shocking and it's the same on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter so uh, yeah help get around those uh, unfriendly algorithms by becoming a supporter and also just write in, talk to us you know, um, leave comments on YouTube let us know what you think about what we're saying and what you'd like us to talk about in the future Like, I, I don't know about you guys, I'd love to hear from our, our listeners a bit more yeah 100% and give us, tell us what we're doing wrong tell us what we can do better yeah. <laughs> Um, it was, it was, no, actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice actually on the, the rally on the weekend, uh, someone came up to me, uh, like a high school student who said they've been listening to the podcast. So 
uh, oh, you know, it's right. it's good. Feels sometimes feels like we're talking into the void, and uh, it's nice to you know hear hear feedback. Yeah, I, I said to Isaac a few. Um, this is me talking directly to the listener. Um, a few months ago, now I think I'm not sure if I want to know how many people listen to this. <laughs> Well, well, we do have listeners, so that's good, uh, and it's good to know that you exist out there. So make your presence known, and um, you know, if, if if people actually want to send in a message or an email or something, um, you can send it to photos at greenleft.org.au, or yeah, just comments on on YouTube or any other platform, and we'll try and have a look at that. And if there's anything that we can respond to on the podcast, we will. Um, but yeah, that's kind of about all we've got time for on this episode. Uh, we'll see you next week uh, for another episode. We'll uh, have an, uh, another interview lined up next week, so uh, keep an eye on your podcast feed. And yeah, thanks for listening. Bye. to live in peace, so do the Palestinians, and um, we come to the protests in solidarity with the Palestinians. Heartened by how many people have consistently turned out. I think this is the biggest protest movement in history, all around the world. It's Lebanon, Yemen, it's of course Gaza, Palestine, it's Syria. There's hardly any country that Israel is not aiming for in the Arab world. So we've got to take a stand and the Australian government's completely complicit. Um, for over 12 months, we've sustained the longest and potentially the largest anti-war movement uh, in this country's history, which shows that the ordinary people stand against this genocide. They stand against Zionism and Israel's brutality and they stand against our, country, our government's you know, connection to Western imperialism and they're, they're at their backing of this genocide. Of course, I'm really happy to join the rally here today. What a great scene. It's all fantastic, all loud and out proud for standing for Palestine, Palestinian liberation. I think we've come a really long way, obviously, in horrific circumstances. But, you know, just last week, the National Tertiary Education Union National Council uh, voted up to accept the boycott, divestment and sanctions within the union. You know, we've had healthcare workers coming out strongly. We've had ASU members who've actually walked off the job on a strike for Palestine. Myself as an MUA member, we've been down the docks um, blockading Zim ships. I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, passion in the community. Well, I think we've built up a lot of, I guess, a lot of public knowledge about the struggle in Gaza and generally against imperialist powers and the aims they use to achieve them. People are turning out, we're getting bigger crowds. Um, sadly, we're also seeing how the government really reacts to our right to protest, our right to assembly, and they crack down hard because it's this year has really shown me that the current government, the Labour Party, don't really care about what the people are asking for. There's just such a huge number of uh, people here in Sydney uh, and around Australia that are, have, have not bought the lies of the mass media and, uh, you know, consciously opposing genocide. Um, they're standing up um, on the right side of history. And um, it really pleases me to see people coming out week after week. I'm happy to join in and support the cause and um, just, you know, let all the Zionists know that, that people are watching and they're opposing what you're doing. My name's Matu, I'm a nurse, registered nurse with the ANMF, and um, I'm here to support Palestine, but really to support the healthcare workers in Palestine, especially nurses in Gaza. We stand with them, we know they've been targeted, and we know that's a war crime. So we won't be silenced by our institutions, we will stand up and fight for the nurses in Palestine. Free, free Australians for a free Palestine. We're here to commemorate one year of accelerated genocide in Gaza um, by the Israeli state uh, and the Israeli occupation forces. We
we've been out here for the last 52 weeks and this week is incredibly important. We want to remind uh, our governments around the world and our Australian government that we will not go away until Palestine is free. The First Nations people to walk aside, aside the, the Palestine people and fight for their fight exactly the same that we, we're fighting for justice in our own communities, you know. And the British, when they colonise this thing, the manufacturers build the bombs here, you know what I mean? So, we, you know, we've got to fight against the oppressed, you know, and, and stand together as one. We know as First Nations people, as standing here right now, I am still a prisoner of war. I am still a victim of genocide myself today with our displacement, with our continued mass incarcerations, deaths in custody, with our babies being stolen, with our waters being poisoned, with our land being taken. So the solidarity is the essential fight for freedom, for justice, for peace. And if it's my duty as a First Nations woman to stand here. It's not really a choice. It's actually my duty. You know, it really is disheartening. We know the police for a lot of people think they're here for public safety measures but they're here to enforce whatever the state wants and the state does not want the masses to come out and to show their dismay for this genocide so they've tried every avenue to repress us and to criminalize us um, when the only people that should be in those jails are the butchers of gaza it's disgusting i mean they just keep on going lower the israel zionists politicians the police Supposedly free speech, it's hypocritical, it's utter bullshit. I still am shocked that I'm so much in disbelief uh, that this is still going on and it's, it's actually increasing and the violence is increasing. Um, the media has been absolutely despicable in, in Australia. I'm so ashamed of the ABC um, and I think we've just got to keep going because it's really important for us not to lose hope while these terrible atrocities continue. Um, because the people in Palestine are still standing strong. And so um, it's really important that we do as much as we can with the democracy that we have, even though it's failing us and them. We can't stop marching. And I don't mean just marching, because I mean all the things. We have to basically continue the work and educate more and more people and build these marches to it. Actually, it will be the when we have absolutely massive numbers in the street that we will be changing this world. We will be changing what politics there are, and we change it one way or another. We change what the politicians do, we change the politicians one way or the other. We are awake to this, and we're not going back to sleep. So we're here to protest, and we'll keep protesting until we see justice in Palestine. This is what we need, a huge united campaign to, uh, to get the message out to the whole Australian people that our government must cut ties with Israel. It gives me hope that, you know, people are on the right side of humanity to keep coming out every week, but to know that the government is not listening to its people is fucking appalling, excuse the English, but um, to know that the people are, you know, still out here, still coming, still solid, it, it really does give hope that you know, things can change. The movement of people, the power of the people to topple government, it, it can happen. Oh, it's beautiful to see the solidarity to come together, especially in, in the Gadigal land, you know what I mean? And Nam and, you know, to see us all come together on one cause, you know what I mean? Fighting against the, the injustice of, of the, 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 these governments, you know, that are all, it's all about control. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep marching, we've got to keep telling the truth, we've got to try and break through the veil of lies. So break all ties with Israel, we're going to rally until we win that. This genocide has been greenlit and funded by Western governments, including so-called Australia. Yeah.